Our scripture continues now with that epic poem that opens the book of Genesis and the Bible. In this, as we get to the creation of the human, it is difficult to replicate in English the grammar in which the human creature is both singular and plural. A human that is created, but it, that is created both male and female. Listen for God's word. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And then from the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, where the risen Jesus meets with his disciples and commissions them, commissions us for our work. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority on heaven and in earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind, or perhaps spirit, from God hovered over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. So opens Genesis and the Bible so opens as well a great deal of religious silliness. For some, a literal understanding of these words becomes an article of faith, something that prohibits them from believing in things such as evolution. For other Christians, some in reaction to the first group, these words are merely symbolic describing a well-ordered cosmos, or they are dismissed entirely, a primitive tale with no real bearing on the modern world. I think all of these views miss the mark, in part because religion, whether it be conservative or progressive or anywhere in between, has a tendency to become utilitarian Utilitarian religion is about getting things that I want from religion, from God. 
Perhaps it's a certainty that I'll go to heaven when I die. Perhaps it's some spiritual well-being that has eluded me, even though I have bought into the competitive, success-oriented, consumerist version of life that our culture peddles. When, when religion becomes utilitarian, it is a resource to be used to get the things that I want. That's true if I'm a conservative who wants a list of things I must believe in and affirm in order to get to heaven, or if I am a progressive who's looking for spiritual meaning and purpose. In either case, I decide what I want from religion, from the Bible, from God. In essence, I decide what God's purpose is. We all saw the most crass example of this utilitarian religion this past week when President Trump stood in front of St. John's Church and waved a borrowed Bible. It was a shameless, brazen enlisting of religion, of God, and to the President's cause. But most all of us engage in more subtle, nuanced, ways of enlisting God into our causes. But back to the Genesis story, when, when this story is first written, it is in part meant to undermine utilitarian notions of God. In the ancient Middle East, the land was filled with gods. Every kingdom had at least one of their own. And these local deities ensured that the crops produced and the herds grew. And when conflicts erupted between kingdoms, they were viewed as contests between these different gods. Holy war, in the truest sense of the term. And Israel's God had lost. The Babylonians had conquered them and had carried much of the population off into exile. Never mind the prophecies promising an endless throne of David. Never mind the assurances that Jerusalem would stand forever. Now there was nothing. The great city, the palace, the magnificent temple of Solomon, all lay in ruins. God had failed them. At this moment of crisis, Israel did not care about how long it took to create the world or how old it was or how well it was structured or ordered. What Israel needed desperately at this moment was a new, expanded, transformed understanding of God. God and how God was related to them the creation itself. The epic poem of Genesis 1 seeks to provide just that, seeks to provide a different picture of God. It, it enlists images from the Babylonian creation myths, but it dramatically and drastically recasts them to describe a new understanding of God, a new sort of God who looks nothing like the typical Middle Eastern God 
resembling very much human rulers. This God has no need for creation, does not feed upon its produce offered up in burnt offerings. This God is no local deity, but a creator who speaks into existence the vastness of the cosmos, a grand cosmos that is the object of God's care and delight. Over and over the poem repeats the refrain, and God saw that it was good. And this is no utilitarian good. It is an aesthetic good. God saw that it was grand, glorious, wonderful, beautiful. The human creature is a part of this wonderful creation, but is also distinct in some way. The human creature in some fashion shares in the image of God, although the story does not say what that means. It does say that it has nothing to do with gender. The human creature is created both male and female. Perhaps the image has something to do with the dominion that human creatures are given over God's creation. Humans are created to rule the creation, the story says. And to many people, that sounds like we humans are free to do whatever we please with creation. It is ours to do with as we choose. And very often, that is precisely what we have done. But I am reasonably certain that the people of God are required to define dominion, to define rule in the same way that God does. God rules as a good shepherd who guards and keeps the sheep, as a loving parent who cares for the children, and God's dominion is most fully seen in the person of Jesus, who gives himself for the sheep. The same Jesus to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given. Today, is Trinity Sunday. Apart from being an excuse to sing holy, 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 many Christians couldn't care much less. Discussing the doctrine of the Trinity is one of the best ways I know to glaze over the eyes of an audience. But I wonder if the Trinity doesn't function for us a little bit like the creation story did for those ancient Israelites, undermining our utilitarian notions of religion, our notions of God as something we can employ for our own purposes, a God who exists to make our life easier or better or more fulfilling. The Trinity speaks of the almighty God of history as the same God whose greatest power is a cross. In the Trinity, the, the spirit that we might describe as a warm feeling inside is also the creator who speaks creation into existence. 
Trinity speaks of a God who exists as relationship. A mystery beyond our comprehending. An unpicturable, unmanageable God who refuses to be enlisted in our plans and schemes, but who invites us to become a part of hers, to redefine ourselves by the strange ways of this strange and mysterious God. Right now, we seem to be living in a liminal moment, a moment that could be the threshold of something different, something new. Old racial and economic systems, systems that very often were blessed, sanctioned, and buttressed by utilitarian religion are failing, teetering. Different groups will argue for this change or for that. Some will long to go back to the good old days and many will invoke God. But will it be the mysterious, unpicturable, unmanageable God who we know best through Jesus? Or will it simply be a utilitarian God of our own making? I wonder what sort of world we might build if we truly lived as though all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to Christ Jesus.